Alrighty then, did you see that filamentary eruption? That's going to be the news of the day. There's a major space weather storm headed in Earth's direction, otherwise known as a solar storm. We'll cover it and lots more tonight at the Smash News Network, least busted name and news, and thanks for tuning in to the Daily Space Weather Show. So up, right up here, you're going to see a filament ejecting as it leaves the sun's atmosphere, known as the solar corona. And that one is headed directly toward Earth. You can expect as high as a KP7 plus from this, so expecting a significant geomagnetic storm. We'll tell you all about it a little bit later. Here are some more views in this same wavelength. So earlier today, the exciting story was down there in the southwest, one of the areas where we had a flare watch set up for yesterday. And yeah, the flare watch continues both in the southwest and the southeast. So more exciting times for space weather. No real surprise as we get closer and closer to solar maximum. So here's a view of the entire southern hemisphere. And there's a great Hyder flare there, really a, one of the most significant ones perhaps we've ever covered on the channel. A lot of plasma splashed back down. So that was a long duration M-class event. There was a mild proton event associated with that as well. We'll cover that also. Here's the equatorial view real quick, and let's take a look at some close-ups before we move on. So there's that setting sunspot group. The solar flare watch remains for that area. And dag, that's not half bad. Still certainly an active sunspot. And of course, just the proximity to the limb makes it more likely to produce additional large flares. And we're going to show more of that here in a minute first. Let's take a look at sunspots briefly. There's the SDO HMI continuum for today, February 6th, 2024. There's a colorized magnetogram, and that sunspot down in the lower left is not just massive, it is very magnetically complex. We'll show you a close-up, a fantastic video of the magnetic shear of that. First, let's take a brief look at Earth and check it out. The most delicious volcano in the world, Stromboli. Yeah, it makes me hungry just thinking about it. There's a great thermal image of some eruptive activity. You can see some lava sitting on the Sierra del Fuoco slope of Stromboli. Also, the likelihood of a additional eruptive activity at Reykjanes is going up once again. These are the rest of the quakes. I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, these are the rest of the volcanoes that are currently erupting. So yeah, Stromboli, a stronger than usual explosion occurred there. Reykjanes now more likely to erupt as magma injection continues. So it's almost at a critical point there at the Reykjanes Peninsula. Again, a likelihood of additional eruptive behavior. Also, Abiko, Subinose, Jima, Ibu, Semeru, which is exploding, by the way. Also, Merapi, Tacono, Popocatépetl, Sancho Guido, Fuego, Nevado del Ruiz, and Ravenador. And let's don't forget Sabancaya down in Peru. It is also erupting. Next, the past 90 days of earthquake activity there, courtesy of VolcanoDiscovery.com. Here are the past 24 hours of five and greater magnitude quakes. So it's been a pretty light day for earthquake activity in general. El Salvador had the largest event. It was a 5.5 at 1353 Universal Time this afternoon. Less than an hour later, Philippines had a 5.1. Russia had a 5.0 at 1606 Universal Time. And last but not least, Japan had a 5.1. And let's get to some more stats here. But first, some more solar imagery. Uh, so yeah, there's 171 angstroms. All right, folks, not sure what happened there. It's a, it's a disparity in the space-time continuum. I don't know if there was some missing information there. Sorry, uh, there's, there's no way we're going back because I am not feeling 100%. So our next feature is our top view ecliptic plane field plot. And has Earth snapped into a North Pole magnetic sector yet? Well, 
Not yet, but it looks like it could be imminent again, as there is severe magnetic indecision happening in the eastern limb. So you see the way that B field fans out the red portion facing the Earth, and then it shrinks again? That has to do with which magnetic field is the dominant one in the eastern limb. So if you look at our line of sight field plot, you'll see the B field swinging back and forth there in the past couple of days. That depicts four days, by the way. So look at those blue lines there moving all over the place as the sun tries to decide which is the dominant magnetic field in that southeastern limb. It looks like the north magnetic field is coming back, and don't be surprised to see another major conflagration of sunspots in that southeastern limb. It's kind of like a miniature Terminator event. See Scott McIntosh's Twitter feed, Scott McIntosh of NCAR. So check him out on Twitter, Scott McIntosh the originator of also Steve Lehman, the initiator of the, the, uh, the, Terminator, the Terminator event hypothesis about how sunspots form and so on. Basically what happens is magnetic fields cancel each other out, and when one wins, that is a, a recipe for sunspot formation. When they're too equal, the sun doesn't have a tendency to form sunspots, but it's basically holding back until one field wins, and then you'll see sunspots form. So sunspot forecast in the southeastern limb is expect sunspots to start forming there. So those are the facts. Here's our line of sight coronal hole plot, and you'll see coronal holes there forming and disappearing and then reforming again. You see their north pole, and then they change to south pole, and then they're back to north pole. That is the magnetic indecision that we talked about. South Pole Corona holes closing there, and yeah, so lots of activity still in store. You ain't seen nothing yet. We're still like 10 months out, or I'll say 8 months out from solar maximum. So it's going to be a, an exciting 16 months, folks. An exciting 16 months, and I would remind you that oddly numbered solar cycles have a different sort of a, a sunspot curve two evenly numbered solar sunspot cycles. See Twitter for information about that too. Steve Lehman's Twitter page. Anyway, let's take a look at coronal holes here from SDO. So no well-defined coronal holes here at the moment. Again, expect to see an uptick in sunspots in that southeastern limb. Before we get to sunspots, let's take a look at things like sunspot number. And once again, sunspot number now still over 160. It actually leveled out. So the growth that we showed in yesterday's video has leveled out. So it did not continue as forecast. And what can I say? There it is. 161 or so, maybe 162 for the sunspot number. Here's our, our uh, synoptic map. And seeing a very high likelihood of X-class solar flares, 25% as of 1614 universal time, also a, 20, a 1 in 4 chance of a proton event. So yeah, significant activity, just like we said. And here is our flare probability monitor and scoreboard. So a leveling out of sunspot number and an increasing likelihood of major solar flares and additional proton events. We just had one, it was pretty minor. It's already started to drop back down to baseline levels. We'll get to it. First SDO continuum for the last 24 hours. So there's the full disk view. And once again, we're seeing sunspots at extremely large latitudes all the way from 40 degrees north all the way down to right on the equator. And that is a normal feature of solar sunspot maximum. Now we're going to show an extreme close-up of this insane sunspot group. And look at all those umbrae that are to its northeast, which would be up and to the left, also just to its east. Basically what you're seeing there is exactly what we just forecasted. Look at that. More sunspots forming right back in here, right in there. New sunspots. So yeah, tomorrow it looks like an, a certainty that sunspot number will be rising, despite some groups setting in the west. 
Now, one of the great features of tonight's video, video is this SDO HMI magnetogram. Now look at the massive amount of magnetic shear right in this area here. See the way there's that North Pole magnetism mixing into that leading South Pole magnetism? That is quite significant. The likelihood of an X-class solar flare is quite high. So that's the last 24 hours in HMI magnetogram from Solar Dynamics Observatory. And let's move to energetic particles and solar flare since we've had some of that as well. It's a smorgasbord of solar activity. So there's that little proton event we talked about. It has already returned to baseline levels. Just a minor little blip there in the proton flux. And that was associated with this long duration M-class flare, which was that one that occurred down in the southeastern limb. And once again, a great example of how you can see an Earth-directed CME without, without uh, a major solar flare, because solar flares and coronal mass ejections are completely separate phenomena, folks. So don't forget, you see solar flares without coronal mass ejections. You see coronal mass ejections without solar flares all the time. In fact, you even see coronal mass ejections without sunspots. And that is what we saw. Again, a major one headed Earth's direction. So there's SDO 131 plus 94. The T mass would be down here. That is the most active sunspot with that long duration M-class flare and proton event producing solar flare or CME. Relativistic particles making its way, making their way all the way from the sun to the Earth at a significant percentage of light speed. So there's the equatorial zoom, and let's take a brief look at our this group in the southeast. That is just a burly sunspot as more form around it. So North Pole magnetism now once again looking like it's winning that magnetic tug of war in that southeastern limb. Here's our T-mass, the most active sunspot of the last 24 hours. That long duration M-class event right there. Another very bubble-like solar flare as well. Fantastic wavelengths to view that. The 131 plus 94 angstroms wavelengths, they take 10 images per minute instead of only two, so a five times higher temporal resolution. One of the reasons those are so good at viewing solar flare activity And let's move to a star chart before we get to CMEs. So there's a star chart. That's what's going on overhead right now, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania. If you want to view it yourself, head to skyandtelescope.org. Just put in your location, click now. And there you go. We've got Saturn setting there and Jupiter up high on the ecliptic over Lehigh Valley. Here is our solar system forecast from theplanetstoday.com. So that's where things are now. We'll advance this one week for heavenly bodies. Here's where things will be in a week. We're like four days out from the new moon of February. But that's where things will be on the 13th as Earth moves to this lonely side of the solar system with zero planets. Next, our astronomy photo of the day. And this one's just splentacular. So in the, on the left there, you've got Hubble imagery in ultraviolet. And on the right, you've got James Webb Space Telescope imagery in infrared. So a great example of how different the features are that you're able to see in those wavelengths. And of course, the imagery on the right is depicting uh, that's oxygen in blue and hydrogen in, in orange there. On the left, it's just different ultraviolet spectra there. So a little more similar to the SDO AIA wavelengths on the left. That's the Hubble Space Telescope over here. Over here is the James Webb Space Telescope. Higher resolution, but it looks blurrier because it is infrared light. So there's the full view, and you can actually switch them back and forth here. Pretty awesome. apod.nasa.gov is the astronomy photo of the day. Not half bad. And let's move on to, cor to coronal mass ejections. So CMEs, again, there's a major one headed in Earth's direction. Let's take a look. 
There's the George Mason University, and right about 12 noon today, bang! A massive CME originating up at the northern polar region blasts off, and it's not very often that we see a CME like that headed directly toward Earth, but the magnetic fields steered that coronal mass ejection right towards your doorstep. So right in, right in there, you see that halo form. A perfect example of an earthly directed coronal mass ejection. Don't be surprised to see a KP 7.3, a major geomagnetic storm is possible. It still does depend on plasma density, but mainly magnetic field orientation and magnetic field intensity. The two most important features there, just as important as the solar wind density and solar wind velocity. We're expecting that one to arrive actually uh, sometime around midday on the 9th of February. Let's take a look at some more views here. Here's the Lasco C3 on the right and C2 on the left. And here comes that CME. The C2 is ahead, so view it on the left and then move your gaze over to the right. So a secondary event there blasting off out of the northern hemisphere, but there's that halo. And let's take a look at our custom coronagraphs. So there's the one from the southwest. There's the halo eruption headed directly toward Earth. It's actually a long duration CME as well. So when that does strike Earth, we could expect that to last for like 10, 12, 14, 16 hours maybe. So it's going to be a major geomagnetic storm over an extended period of time. Could cause some satellite drag and so forth. Should be an exciting time for space weather. So here you'll see this filament and there it goes. Or should I say, here it comes. pretty sweet and here we've dropped the C3 which is in blue and added the 193 angstroms to the SDO there great view of that filament blasting off and what happened let me try that again there we go there's the full disk equatorial view some massive plasma filaments once again rising in the east as well. And there's that long duration flare and CME from the southwest. Anyway, let's move on to filaments. There we go. First, filaments from Cerro Tololo, Chile. So you see this huge filament up here? It was there, and and then it's gone because it is headed in your direction. So exciting stuff going on there, and we're glad to bring you the world's most comprehensive daily space weather content and most detailed solar imagery. We'll also show the latest couple of hours there from the GO-16 SUVI, massive plasma filaments all around, both the east and western limbs. Crown prominence is at both poles. It's looking more and more like an active solar maximum. And you ain't seen nothing yet, folks. So anyway, before we get the bonus features, here is the full disk view. Exciting stuff, wouldn't you say? So first bonus feature is satellite charging hazards and some minor surface charging there as low energy electrons are building up on spacecraft north of the equator in the northern Indian Ocean. There you go. Won't cause any major errors. Goes electron flux here in a normal operating range. Nothing too exciting going on there. There's the one year graph of the electron flux. There's the forecast model by NOAA. The green boxes are the forecast. The yellow diamonds are the observation. We'll also show the layer where it's measured. The F layer of the ionosphere. So there you go. That's the, there's a diagram of the atmospheric layers, uh, atmospheric temperature gradients, and uh, 
electromagnetic radiation, penetration, and chemical densities. Here is the ionosphere in vibrational frequency, and things are geomagnetically calm, so nothing too exciting going on in the ionosphere. Here's the anomaly gram, anomaly in megahertz from a 30-day median, high frequency in blue, low frequency anomaly in red. And again, things are pretty chill when it comes to that. We'll also show the Global Ionosphere Nowcast, or WAM, the whole atmosphere model. GPS users should benefit from the left panes, and radio, high-frequency radio users should benefit from the right panes. And leave us a comment, or you are a pane. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you press the subscribe button. Regardless of whether you're new to the channel, press the like button, or else. So there are our latest high-res images. This sunspot down in the north, in the southeast, is Beta Gamma Delta class. Wow! Look at the magnetic field shear there. Check it out. That is a prime example of a of a ready to produce an X-class flare type sunspot, folks. So that is major solar flare warning in effect. Here's the full disk rock back. And it's time, time to move on to our meteorology segment. We bring you the space weather, and then we bring the Earth weather all the way down to the lower 48. Here are the surface winds of the eastern world. There are the jet streams, jet streams of Europe, Africa, and the Middle East there. The central world's surface winds. The America's surface winds. And let's don't forget the America's jet streams. So there you go, the forecast's coming true on the channel. Next we'll show clouds and fog. There are the Americas in shortwave radiation from the NASA GOES Interactive Weather Satellite Suite. See that strong low there off the coast of Florida now forming exactly as we said it would yesterday. And we've got a bunch of additional moisture here being piped in from the Pacific. Some major precipitation coming to Arizona. We'll get to the forecast here in a moment. And we're going to show you the GFS and the Euro model here. There you go. So first of all, rain accumulation. So check it out. We've got some heavy rains coming now. More rains coming to Southern California. That's the Euro model for the next three days of rain accumulation. So let's move, a, let's move this around a little bit. So most of it's done there for Southern California, but Arizona now expecting up to nearly three inches of rain in some areas. That's the Euro model. Here's the GFS model showing a little bit wider spread. Basically just like looks like lower resolution. That is rain accumulation for the next three days GFS as well as Euro model. Next our weather.gov map. Weather.gov is where to get your weather warnings if your locations are lit on the map. Head to weather.gov and homepage of the National Weather Service. I think those might be too many counties for us to cover. We still do have some flood watches in parts of California and Arizona, especially also some coastal flood watches there on the mid-Atlantic states. So next are forecasts. These are from tropicaltidbits.com, folks. Tropicaltidbits.com. Check it out if you want to make your own awesome forecast. Here are the GFS data for the next 72 hours. The GFS 72-hour pressure and precipitation forecast. You can see multiple systems there showing up in California, one coming out of the, well, it's coming out of the Pacific. I'll just say that. There's a loitering low off the coast of California. Here's our GFS total accumulated precipita precipitation forecast for the next 72 hours. I'm not going to try to explain it. That's why we have the graphics on the screen. Next are accumulated positive snow depth change in inches for the same model, the GFS 72 hour. Heaviest snows there coming to Colorado, despite all the hot air emanating, expecting over three feet in some areas like southern Colorado. 
There's not enough hot air to melt all of that snow in a rapid fashion. Last but not least, our GFS 72-hour temperature anomaly forecast in degrees Celsius. So there you go. Extremely warm weather continuing for northeastern Canada as temperatures get to like 25 degrees Celsius above normal for large sections. Dag. Mostly colder than normal west of the Rockies. Next lightning. That's the past like 10 hours. And here's our real-time lightning map, courtesy of lightningmaps.org. We don't have any terrestrial strikes in the U.S. right now, I don't think. But we do have some in the southwestern Atlantic. For example, off the coast of Dominica, I'm sorry, Puerto Rico. All right. There you go, real-time lightning map. And we'll close out the video with Doppler radar, clouds and fog, and water vapor. So first, ground-based systems that detect vertical motion in the air column, like water droplets and ice crystals. The U.S. Doppler radar map for the lower 48. Shortwave radiation showing clouds and fog, even when it's too dark for the visible satellite. And last but not least, water vapor. When your radar is unclear, try the water vapor. You hear? Here's your recap. Doppler radar. Clouds and fog, water vapor, and remember folks, dry air at a given temperature is more massive than moist air. And I'll just leave it there. Thanks for tuning in to the Smash News Network, least busted name in news. I've been your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash on Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind be at your back. While I go back to the bunker again. Whoa.